Um, yeah, hi. Thank you for coming along. I wanted to tell you about some development tools I made for myself uh, uh, in the last little while. Um, yeah, so I am Australian. If you're wondering what this, ac this weird accent is, um, you are allowed to use your export quality Australia Crocodile Dundee jokes on me. It's great fun. Um, I'm uh, working at Clara Inc. at the moment as a uh, OpenCFS developer. Um, I spent had a long career as a Linux sysadmin and decided I'd had enough of that. Um, so naturally, I am here. I end up hanging around a lot of FreeBSD people, I'm more of a groupie than a committer at this point, but uh, maybe one day they'll promote me. Um, just uh, I haven't done this talk before. I also have not tested this talk before, so I'm going to move pretty fast. Let me know if I'm talking too fast. Um, and but we should have some time for questions at the end. Uh, there's a link down here. If you go here, that will have that has a link to the slides and all the other links that are in here. And I'll be putting more stuff up there later. So whatever. Um, and also, if someone could keep an eye on the IRC room for whatever room this is, eleven twenty, um, just because there was there's been people asking questions in previous uh, 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 sessions and no one's reading. So just in case something comes up. Okay, um, right, so I consider myself like an exploratory programmer. I'm sort of self-taught and I didn't work as a programmer for a long time. And so by this I mean like, I don't know if this is a real kind of word, but by this I mean like, if I want to write some software, I don't really plan ahead of time. I have a very vague idea of what I want to do, but I want to like write a line of code and run it and see what happens. Maybe it works, maybe it fails, maybe it crashes. Um, and just keep just exploring the problem space. I don't really write many error checks, um, you know, sort of thing, just until I get a feel for, okay, what are the constraints here? What does this task mean? Uh, what are my options? And then I can start to, you know, push in a particular direction. So, um, and yeah, like I said, I'm not being particularly defensive in this mode. I am, uh, I'm not writing error checks. I'm not thinking about safety. I'm not thinking about locks. I'm not thinking about like production niceties. I'm not thinking about, you know, operation, so operability or whatever. Um, so my programs will crash, they'll eat all the memory, they'll hang, they'll do all sorts of weird stuff. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter in user space. Um, it doesn't matter in an interpreted language. Um, you know, you just, you fix the thing and you keep going. This, this is screenshot, but this is like my standard thing. This is what's always on my screen. I have so many of these kind of two of things. Code on the right, shell on the left, type, 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 run, see what happens, off we go all day long. Um, so of course, naturally, I would choose to move into kernel programming, where when you screw up, um, you know, every crash means a reboot, or every deadlock means a reboot. Uh, you boot, you know, boot times are slow. They're slower than like two seconds of sort of iterating. Um, unclean shutdown, eventually your VM's toast um, because you've smashed the disk so many times. Um, Traditional VMs are kind of a pain to manage if you're blowing them up all the time, you know, there are a few commands to restart or they're clicking things in VirtualBox or whatever they are. Um, and I get bored and distracted very easily. Um, and I thought about a project I had earlier in the year where I actually did have to use VirtualBox to test my work and I would like kill it and flip to another screen and go away and come back two hours later and be like, oh yeah, I was just waiting for the reboot and I've forgotten what I've done. Um, that's how it goes. So I thought, I thought about this problem for a while and I sort of made some observations, which are not new. Um, I don't claim these are really kind of unique. We run programs in modified environments all the time. Um, you know, we use env to change the environment variables. We use chroot to, you know, set a different route. We run our programs in a different language environment, right? Um, so I thought, you know, if you, if you think about it, a hypervisor is just a program that runs another program, a kernel. A kernel is just a program that runs a program called init. An init is just a program that runs another program. So why can't I do this? And so it should just be programming, right? And so I set myself the task of writing whatever ZFS kernel runner is. And at the time I started, I had no idea. And I thought about, you know, what would I need? I would like this to feel just like another program. All the output goes to standard out, so I can grep it, I can do stuff with it, I can control C it to kill it, or my operating system will kill it if it gets really stupid. Um, 
it boots in, you know, it gets there in a couple of seconds. I don't want to wait for minutes. To, I, like, and I need it to run when I run it. And so I can see the output in a few seconds and get back to the code. Um, I want it gone. I, it, when it crashes, I want it to be like a regular Unix process. I want it to no longer exist. Um, I don't want bits left around in the kernel. I don't want bits left around in the file system, unless I deliberately do want them, um, you know, because I piped the output somewhere. Um, I don't want to type a whole b extra bunch every time. I just, you know, like bash foo.sh, perl, duh, 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 dot perl. I want something I can just run my program in, and it kind of changes the environment. Um, and I want to work on my host system. That's where all my development tools are. That's where um, you know, my internet connection is. That's where I'm going to do all my you know, post hoc analysis of what went wrong. That's where I'm going to pipe it through my, you know, my crappy little Perl scripts that are going to rip apart the output and correlate things and all the rest of it. I don't want to have to copy things in and run them. It's, it's, no. Um, so, and these aren't really squad goals. I work in like UTC 10. Everyone's asleep while I'm working, so it's just me, but I pretend um, ChatGPT has been a boon because I can talk to it. <laughs> um, sure, it'll be right. And so I wrote this runner thing, and I called it quiz. Um, and I will say this for the last time because I've now erased uh, uh, each of it. I thought I need something about three or four letters, and I decided it was the... QMU interactive ZFS environment. I thought that's dumb, but that's what you do. But I actually said that in the review for a little while. So um, yeah, that's oh, it's on the video now. Anyway, um, <laughs> it's fine. So what quiz is? It's a collection of bash scripts. Um, it which just pulls a bunch of stuff together. So it pulls together the QMU micro VM profile, which I'll talk about a little bit. Um, in a minute, if you haven't already seen it. It um, uses a custom build of Linux kernel. Um, oh yeah, remember, 20 years Linux guy. This is a Linux laptop. I develop on Linux for the moment. I'm talking more about FreeBSD in a minute. Um, so this is all Linux for the moment, which is kind of weird um, <laughs> at this conference. But anyway, um, it's a minimal Debian user space. Um, it has a custom boot process, um, you know, to obviously do the two or three second boot that I, I said that I was sort of aiming for. Um, uses 9PFS and OverlayFS to kind of construct the root file system in a way that we can bring things in from the outside, still be able to write things on the inside and remove everything uh, without a trace afterwards. Um, it has this facility for profiles, which can add devices, extra facilities, you know, environmental changes for a single run. Um, and it has some extra hooks for OpenZFS build support because that's what I do, obviously. So. Um, so the micro VM profile, it is, how has that slash got there? It's, it doesn't matter. Um, but basically, it is a tiny, tiny uh, uh, AMD64, x86-64, whichever system we call it, uh, machine model that has kind of nothing in it. Um, so you know, it has 64-bit processors and memory and everything, um, but it doesn't have a PCI bus. It doesn't have a CPI. It doesn't have option ROMs. It doesn't have all this stuff. Um, it has like. And it only has slots for uh, uh, memory mapped VertIO devices. And the good thing about all this is because there's nothing to initialize. So it boots really fast. And because you know exactly what it's got in there, you can build a kernel that only supports that. My, the kernels I build for this don't have PCI support, so they don't need to do PCI enumeration, um, which costs time. So, um, you know, and, and sort of all the way down. Um, because you've got a fixed set of uh, oh, hang on, we get into that, don't we? Um, oh, that's exactly what I was saying, right? Yeah, all dry. So, yeah, don't need to go looking for hardware that we know isn't there. And um, I don't know exactly where this falls in, like, the various BSD stacks, but the, the Linux thing is you load the kernel, and then there is an init RD, which is a um, just like a compressed in-memory file system, and that usually has all the drivers and, like, a very simple system in there, and its entire job is to as the kernel goes looking for things to offer bits of firmware, bits of driver modules to, um, you know, construct the system with what you need. That's what you get when you get your, you know, your Red Hat or your Debian distribution. But I know what drivers I need, so I just compile them directly into the kernel to the extent that I don't need it in at RD, which means I don't have to load one, I don't have to enumerate through it, it's like I don't have to do all that shit. Um, there's a minimal Debian user space. Um, so it uses a, min, a variant called MinBase, which is a little bit like 
uh, base TG, TGZ, it's like the required, um, like the absolute minimum required packages and the package manager. It's like it's like 30 packages or something. Um, and then I mix in a whole bunch of other tools that I uh, want and need to, you know, do the work that I'm going to do in there. I want profiling tools. I want to be able to build interesting block devices. Um, yeah, KSH and friends to run a test suite and a bit of stuff that I need to make a usable environment. Uh, and then I have a custom boot process. Uh, so we have uh, init1, which just constructs the root file system and then brings it online. Uh, Linux does this thing where during early boot, it, it has a root file system that it gets from the init RD. Then it goes out to the disks, it finds the real root file system, it mounts it, and then it does a swap. And then it tears the other side down. Um, that's just how you do it. So it does that, and then that bounces into init2, which does the setup, loads up the profiles that we said, uh, you know, builds out whatever it needs, runs a thing called Tiny, 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 um, and is basically, which is a, a third party thing that is used a lot in Linux containers, and it is like the smallest uh, PID1 you can sort of get. It does just, just the, the basics. All right, so I've tried very hard to make a working demo. So let's see if we can get this going. And why is my phone beeping? That sucks. Um, oh yeah, okay, so if I do that, that's all on the screen, great. I do that, and then I do that, and then I can kind of see my little script here. Super. So um, you run a quiz on its own. As I say, it's a shell, and now we're in a, we're in a VM. Um, you know, it's sort of real, you know, it looks, it has all the trappings that you'd kind of expect. You know, it's a, it's a VM, it's whatever. Um, you know, it has, apparently has a file system, which is kind of great. Um, we can, you know, we can put files in the file system. Um, whatever we, why, why is, sorry, my phone's blowing up. I'm like, I would see clowns in the signal, never mind. Um, um, yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> So that's all right, and then we quit out of that. Yeah, you get a backtrace because it, it panics. That's the panics that would normally cause your computer to reboot, but like whatever, um, it doesn't matter. Um, but then of course you come in again and just to prove that it's transient, file's not there, so fine. Um, and uh, you know, output is to, well, oh, we can run a program. So we can say quiz, you name dash A, um, and it will run it and, wow, my screen here is so much differently sized to up there. Does that mean I've just been doing this and there's been nothing showing up that you could see except a panic message? You gotta tell me. Uh, yeah, wow, that sucks, okay. That's not scrolling up up here, okay. Wow, this is so weirdly sized. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Oh, I thought it was so clever too. All I'm trying to find, hang on, this is two up. Jeepers. Hey, there we are. <laughs> so there's the init starting and then it ran our program. The plus is just because I'm running it in bash dash X because it's a lot easier to see what's going on. Produces the output and then it's like, oh cool, we're done. So we shut down. Um, uh, you know, you run your program, you run this with dash s and that will run your program and then drop you, so we would have run it just one up, but then it drops you into a shell afterwards. So um, if it blew up in some interesting way or it hung and you want to inspect the kernel state or whatever, you know, you can still do stuff after the fact. Um, and then, you know, get out of there, control C, shuts it down. Uh, output is on standard out. So um, I can do, this and it will do its thing. The demo never works. Let this be a lesson to all of you. This is rude. I swear to God, I run this like a hundred times a day. Like what is going on? I didn't even do a special thing for this. Uh, let's just actually make sure it runs a program. Oh, sorry. Well, it was gonna get part of the, the D message output. There we go. 
the point is, I don't know what I've got wrong, but the point is it's on standard out, and I can just use grep or redirect a file or all my normal tools um, and get whatever. And of course, kernel output and program output is all just blasted straight onto standard out. You know, it can make it a bit tricky later if you want to do stuff with standard error standard, but whatever, whatever. Um, so, you know, like, it's a computer, but the point is I get, I get this business that uh, I like. So, that's the first demo out of the way. Wow, I've only got one more. So, I'm going to tell you how I put this together. I'm not going to show any code because it's just running shell commands. Um, you should go and look at the GitHub. It's, I tried my best to make it very clear bash, not obscure bash, and I tried my hardest to comment everything that's in there. So the way I construct a file system, we start at the bottom. Um, it's a, it happens to be an X2 image um, because the Debian tooling that produces uh, uh, like the base system, um, it would prefer to write an image that is able to have like device nodes and things in it, and that's a little bit more difficult to put into a host dir and then bring through in 9pfs. I don't love it. I'd rather it was just a host system, but it's fine because I don't really do much with it. And so that becomes the root, the sort of initial root file system. And that's where init1 is, um, um, which... <laughs> this program, that's where init1 is because that's the program that gets the root file system online and then we can go into the next bit. So what init1 does, it takes that. There is what I call the, um, the init dir, which is just a host directory, regular host directory. Um, uh, and that is where the quiz program, the shell program, it puts little bits of script fragments and other bits and pieces so we can control what's run on the inside. Um, so it'll drop, it was like if you, so if when I type, you know, quiz like you name dash A or whatever program I want to run, that actually gets put into a shell script that gets generated on the fly and dropped, and it appears inside the guest in slash dot quiz. Um, and so, like, the init process is just running that. Um, so I drop little things in there. Um, and then there is, I didn't say right at the start. Uh, this is building an overlay. Um, so Linux's overlay file system um, can basically build a stack of files. And if there's not, uh, uh, like, if the file doesn't exist or there's not a whiteout for it, it just goes down to the layer below it. So all we're doing here is we're building a stack of read-only file systems because we don't need to write to these. Um, so on top of that, we then have the what I call the system dir. These are just names that I kind of made up. Um, and this is my install target for OpenZFS. So I build OpenZFS or whatever other program I want to use. Like I think I was doing some testing with different versions of like core utils when I was testing how bin CP behaves in different versions. I build them on the outside, um, like, you know, with configure dash dash prefix and just install them in into this directory and that's fine. Um, and then there's the user directory, which is where I just put my programs that, you know, my little test programs that, you know, create a pool, run bio, do some stuff. And really the only reason these are separated for me is it's more about kind of their lifetime, who manages them. You know, the, the init dir is managed by the quiz program. The system dir is kind of on the lifetime of whatever programs I'm building or working on and installing into. And this is just ad hoc stuff that I kind of want to live forever. But the point is these are all read only um, in, inside the guest. Outside they are just directories where I write my code with my regular tools and all the rest of it. Um, and at the top, we put a tempfs in read-write mode. And so things inside the VM have somewhere to write to. But of course, it's just in memory. So when the process dies, it all goes away. So everything is the same every run. And you get a full reset every run. Uh, so that's init1. And then we flip into init2, which just does kind of the minimum that you have to do to get a Linux system up. Um, you know, set the host name, uh, start udev to get the slash dev nodes, uh, mount the debug file systems uh, in, well, I know FreeBSD well enough to know that um, all of the little knobs and, and information about what the kernel is doing, you get through uh, syscontrol. In, uh, in Linux, there are just extra magical file systems you mount, and they're like many tens of them. Um, so you mount all those up so you can do things like, uh, you know, in kernel tracing or lock debugging or all sorts of stuff. So that's fine, that's the way it works. Um, and then we execute our PID1 and we say either run a shell or run the little script we wrote that has our program in it. Um, and then off it goes. 
So that's kind of cool. Um, and yeah, and this is teeny tiny, I don't know. But this is it, and yeah, it does the smallest amount of PID one can get away with. It runs a program, it reaps zombie processes that get attached to it, um, it provides the default signal handlers, um, and yeah, this is used everywhere, like every Docker container almost certainly has this at the bottom of it because it's just nice and um, yeah, you don't put system D in a container. Uh, no. Yeah, it, 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 it starts the single program that you ask it to and it exits when that program exits. If that first program was a process supervisor, then it would work that way. Um, so, give me a sec. Um, so, profiles are, they're a bit ad hoc. They're kind of just, a lot of this, like, I've only built this for myself. So, a lot of it is just, I've tried to carefully hack into things as I need them. So, that's just to add extra stuff to this run. Because as you saw there, I was only running, like, you know, running basic Unix commands. I didn't do any ZFS stuff. Um, profile, so you specify a profile. I'll show you in a minute. Um, you write quiz dash p profile comma profile comma profile and profiles can run stuff on the host so like in the quiz program to do setup then they get the opportunity to also run a program inside the guest before the user's program is started um, and they can also have extra files that are installed into the VM um, like on this run and then removed afterwards, so if they want to provide a helper script or, or something like that. Um, so I have a few of these. Um, so the DFS profile, um, on the host it runs depmod. Depmod is like um, when, you, when you compile kernel modules, it like recomputes the symbol dependencies so that the module loader can find it. So we run that on the host because I need to because I've usually just recompiled ZFS. Um, and then in the guest, it installs the ZFS module like early before I start up. So as soon as my command runs, I already know what's there. Um, memdev, uh, memdev just creates a few uh, 100 megabyte uh, like memory backed block devices inside the VM, um, which obviously just go away when I'm done. But then I also have blockdev. Blockdev creates a number of one gig sparse files in the host and then um, it, it extends the QMU command line to bring them in as like vertio block devices. So if I want to do, if I want to do something <clears throat> backed by real storage or I want to do something on, you know, like I can't, I can't create six gigabytes of, um, I, mean, I can, but I can't create six gigabytes of memory backed uh, uh, block devices inside the VM because my actual computer gets sad. Um, so that's how we do that. Um, and then there's a profile called ZTest, which doesn't do anything during startup, but um, the ZFS test suite um, is adamant that it will not be run as root. But of course, I don't have users in here. Why would I bother? Um, so I drop in like hacked, like little scripts called sudo and id, which are earlier in the path, where it says, um, yeah, I need to run this as root. I'm like, cool, I'll just run it. And also, what id am I? Well, you're zero, of course. Um, that stuff should go into ZFS proper, and I will do it at some point because, um, yeah. And so let's try this. Other, other one, now that I know more about what lies are going on behind me. So this is something I do. This is the one that I do a thousand times a day or something very like it. Um, Z pool create tank loop O, loop one, which are the, the uh, RAM devices um, and the Zpool status. And now that I know that it's not going to appear on the screen, I know that we'll be able to zoom back up. So you see there, it's loading the ZFS, which takes a few seconds, which is something I've got to work on. Um, I know why that is, but it just sucks a bit right here. Uh, where are we? Wow, that's gone like back to the top. That's amazing. Okay. So you see, yeah, so it creates it, runs Zpool status. It's a a ZFS pool, fine. And then we kill it and it dies. So, but that was like, so that entire run was seven seconds. Um, so if I, you know, that's great. If I was testing something around loading the ZFS module or creating pools or whatever, um, you know, it's an under 10 second turnaround to see if my bullshit just worked, right? I'm kind of mouthy on the video. I need to stop that. <laughs> um, 
It can also run the test suite. Um, so again, using that ZTest profile, so here we're setting up to run the ZPool list uh, section of the, the test suite. It can't run the entire test suite. It's the test suite's kind of full on, but um, it can run many, many parts of the test suite. Um, so it'll do its thing. It, sp it just spawns a test runner. You know, it ran four tests or something just then. What? Well, at least I've learned things out of this. Hey, didn't think about that. But yeah, so it ran the test off to the. Okay, that didn't wrap well because nothing's working. But it says pass, 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 and then pass. pass. Great. So again, I can run bits of the test suite. So wait, like I do this all the time. Once I get the feeling that like, yeah, this thing's working, that's where it, when I'll push it to an internal Git repo, I'll bring it down onto a test machine that's got like, you know, actual grunt and I'll start doing my work there. But for just exploring the space, I don't want to crash the kernel a hundred times. It's tiring. Um, so, cool. All right, so the last bit is, yes, there's a support script to help with building OpenZFS. Ideally, I would like to do this. Um, this is the ZFS uh, 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 Git client. Um, and it would do the right thing. That would be cool. This is what you actually have to do. Um, obviously, you know, I don't want system D. I don't want some other in its system. I don't have an authentication system in there, so I don't bother. I've got to point it to the right kernel that I'm building for. Um, I've also got to, there are no command line options for this thing, but I have to, you know, like override the path, which is very Debian specific. So, and then I need to say, when you install, I want you to pretend the root is over here. So that I want to put into the ZFS configure script in some way at some point, but I haven't really thought too much about it. So, but for now, um, I just wrote a helper script. Um, it intercepts configure and make install and considers the args and adds what it needs if you haven't specified those args, but it will also add more. So if I write configure, enable debug, enable debug info, it will add those switches to all the ones it adds. So I still get a debug build or whatever. And that works so well that I have not really been inclined in over a year to go and fix the other thing. Um, um, I'm not gonna show you all these stuff, but like it has a lot of support for um, different Linux kernels. One of the things about the Linux kernel is every, definitely every point release, you know, 6.1, 6.2, and often within minor releases, they will significantly change internal APIs. Um, and so uh, ZFS may not build or it may do something different. So it is really useful for me to be able to build a lot of different kernels and run things against it. So all of the scripts, quiz, the kernel preparation scripts, the configure script, all of that stuff will take a dash K option to say, which kernel version am I using? Um, there's options in there to like build a, build a kernel but flip on different uh, configure options when you rebuild it and use that for a one-shot run, um, which is nice. Like there was a, there was a bug reported where someone um, noticed that there's a security feature you can enable that will rather than uh, when you allocate space on the stack, instead of it just being like undefined by C, it will either make it all zeros or it will make it like a pattern fill. So the idea being to catch people who are using undefined memory incorrectly. Um, and that and Clang were playing in an interesting way, um, which is when I also added Clang support as well. But using these features allowed me to actually better reproduce what uh, this user was seeing. And I mean, obviously doing a kernel build, that takes a while, um, though it's a very minimal config, so it, uh, it's pretty quick, um, as in, it's sort of 20 minutes. That's right, you don't do them very often. So I have a lot of things that I want to do with this. Um, I, I have an early version of like a multiple architecture uh, support because that, that targets um, big Indian PPC because I want to, ZFS is like, tries to be Indian agnostic, um, but there's very little real big Indian hardware out there anymore. Um, I don't know if that's still a thing that we really want for ZFS, not sure, but at least like to find out if it still works, right? Uh, so I do have the start of some of this. ZFS is very hard to cross compile though, so I haven't quite finished that off yet. Um, I wanna make a writable host mount, wouldn't be much hard to do, but then I can like drop logs and test suite results directly in there and any artifacts from the internal run for analysis and that sort of thing. I can say, it, like anything I haven't done yet, I just, it hasn't quite been annoying enough, mostly. 
Um, I want profiles for building uh, block devices out of DM stacks. So uh, Linux's device mapper has um, basically all the, you, you kind of assemble your own block device out of all these pieces. So you might say, uh, you know, I want check something and I want software RAID and I want encryption and I want I want you to you know reroute this region of this device to that region of that device and I want you if there's anyone who tries to do a read from in there you return an error. Um, so I kind of want some kind of like the, the config is really arcane so I kind of feel like I want some kind of easier way to say, could you construct a device that will do this particular thing for me? Um, usually produce errors. Um, I haven't thought much about that. I want to put Tmux inside it, like one shell that's a console is kind of a pain in the ass. I want to be able to have a Tmux server inside that I can then connect to and I can run multiple shells and then I can inspect my program while it's running rather than like backgrounding it and dealing with the mess of output. Um, at the moment I only have one instance, like it's in home code quiz, um, I'd like to be able to say each ZFS checkout has like its own config that it's working against its own thing. So because sometimes like while I'm building and doing a longer test, I want to go over there and work on a different feature and um, I sort of have to wait. But none of this is that much a big deal. But the thing I really want is FreeBSD free support because of course I turn up um, at, at Clara and I say, hey cool, look I wrote this thing and everyone's like, yeah, it's great, can I use it? And I'm like, no. Um, and so I have spent some time looking into what it would take. Um, and FreeBSD support can mean two things. Um, oh, sorry, obviously it's important because OpenCFS targets FreeBSD and Linux. And so I would like to be able to easily test my changes for FreeBSD as well, make sure I'm not breaking stuff there. And I'd like to be able to work on FreeBSD specific features, which I, at the moment, I use a real free, FreeBSD machine for, which means I don't do as much of that work as I might like. Um, guest support is getting close. Um, we have the Firecracker kernel config now, which uh, Firecracker is another micro VM framework, which is used in uh, like at least uh, Amazon Web Services somewhere in there. Um, again, same idea, minimal kernel configuration. Um, fast booting is the thing. Um, it can be cross-built on Linux host. Uh, so like that's sort of easy. Um, we don't have a working 9PFS client yet. That is really close to, to landing is my understanding. And so I won't make any promises on anyone else's behalf, but um, soon, soon, soon. Um, obviously you don't have to use 9PFS. It's any kind of network share that you might like. You could do it with an NFS mount instead. But that means you've got to have like some kind of NFS server on the host. Um, the, the 9P server is exists inside QMU, inside the hypervisor. So like it's one less piece you need. Um, and to do this, to do it the way I like to do it, I need that stacked overlay thing. Um, you don't necessarily need that for this style of thing. There's a lot of different ways you could achieve it. I mean, you do it with symlinks if you really wanted to. Um, but a really cool overlay FS would make this a lot easier for the way I like to work. I do hear that's coming. I will let the person stick their hand up if they wish. I'm not going to help them though. <laughs> so, um, so that would be super cool. Host support um, is a little more complicated. Well, it is a little more complicated, but also it's a little more complicated because I'm going to have to do some of it and I'm not very good at FreeBSD yet. Um, but basically, we need more hypervisor support. We either need, QMU needs hardware acceleration, so that's not strictly true. This does actually work with QMU right now. Like, I can run this system on a FreeBSD machine running Linux hosts, but it's only using software uh, CPU uh, stuff. So um, it's a little bit sluggish once you start really working it. Um, so either that or Beehive needs more support for doing, for starting a VM without a disk uh, and for making it disappear without a trace when it's done. Um, so I started working on direct Linux boot for Beehive. So when I say direct Linux boot, and you might have seen this if you've done anything with other operating systems as well, QMU lets you do this. Um, you know, the first review too. So how many, yeah, how many CPUs I want, how much memory I want, and this is the kernel, and here's some stuff to append to the kernel command line. And if you do this, so like with, so I ran this earlier today, so this is with just the, the Debian stock kernel that runs my laptop. When I do this, it boots the kernel. 
it eventually freaks out because it has no devices. All it has is a, a, a serial line. So it says, well, I can't find a root device. I don't have an init ID. I don't have any devices. I'm done. But I didn't, as soon as I control C that, that goes away. I don't have to have a, uh, you know, a block device or an image to boot off. I don't need any of that stuff. So I thought, cool, I'll just do that. I'll just do whatever Beehive's equivalent of that is. Beehive doesn't have an equivalent of that. Um, Beehive's brute process is this. It allocates a big chunk of memory. It maps like a, it's equivalent of a BIOS into that as like a, a virtual ROM device. Um, it points the boot CPU at it, and then it does a standard PC boot. You know, it goes and finds the boot device, it loads the bootloader, it uh, then goes and finds, you know, an operating system on the disk, or it does the EFI stuff, or all the rest of it, okay? Um, which is fine. It is a computer emulator. It's what you want it to do. Um, obviously, I cannot assert that quite as strongly, because we do have ARM64 support now. Um, and I don't exactly know how that works. So, <laughs> but that's kind of what you get. But if you squint, this step is just, if you put stuff in the memory. So you put programs in there. You set up the CPU to understand how to run that program. And then you go. Yeah, exactly. Anywhere you want, whatever weird broken code you load into it. And I say that because that's what I would do. And if you're all better programmers than me, then that leaves me on my own. So it's okay. Self-deprecating humor. It's brilliant. Um, so I wrote this. Um, I extended Beehive to have this concept of a loader. Um, it's heavily cribbed from the boot ROM code. Um, but you basically say, you know, I want the loader called Linux, so it can, has support for multiple loaders. And here are some options that the loader will go and find. There is an init RD option as well, which does work, but I didn't use it for this. So if you have that code, and you run this, which is the same kernel as before, you get the same thing. Okay. So that's really nice. Um, so you need a boot protocol. So a boot protocol is, uh, a kernel is just a program. As well as I have notes here. Uh, a kernel is just a program. Um, and the CPU jumps to it, and it starts executing it. And what does it need to know to get started? Um, it needs a memory layer. It needs to know the layout of memory because memory is not one big long run. Memory has holes in it. It has devices in it. So it needs to understand, you know, which bits of memory am I allowed to use? Um, it needs to know where the very basic devices are that it needs to just do, you know, the trappings of being a computer. Um, it needs to know what options it's supposed to turn on and off that the, that the user wants. Um, and it needs to know where its support code is, like where are my drivers, where is my second stage or third stage loader, um, all these kind of things. Um, and so the boot control, boot protocol is a description of how to give that information to the kernel. Now most, most, most devices past the point have a fairly uniform way of doing that, most architectures. Um, that's where you get things like device tree and stuff like that, it's like, you know, you put this in a common place and different architectures kind of have vaguely the same conception. It's not true, but like, that's a really good place to start if you want to understand that. The x86 boot protocol um, is pretty chaotic, as is x86. <laughs> you can always tell the people who know. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit of their soul leaves their body. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't even pretend to know, but um, uh, that much. But it's been through a lot of changes over the years because it has to deal with, you know, well, how do you do, um, um, mem like, how do you discover the memory space? Do you get it in ACPI tables or do you have to ask the BIOS for it? Or are you doing a, um, like an MBR or a GPT boot? Um, what processor modes are in place when you start? All this kind of stuff. So Linux has a direct 64-bit protocol, so if you can bring the machine up in 64-bit long mode, it will start. And I thought, well, that seems, I thought that seems sensible, um, because then I don't have to, I don't have to pretend that I'm on an old computer. It turned out to be hard, but I got it, go, got it to go. So I feel like I'm doing even better than QMU, because QMU does start you in real mode and puts a little boot thing to, to bring you up through the different modes. I just did the dumb thing. So, and someone asked me, and I'm like, I don't, didn't know that I could do it differently. Anyway. The boot protocol for Linux, you start off by loading your whatever it was, VM, Linux, numbers. The first, like, so in there is a big compressed chunk of code that is the kernel. And it has this little header at the front. This is your header template. 
The header template has some information about the kernel in it. Um, so you do some sanity checks. Does it have the right magic number? Does it have the right, um, are you using the right protocol version? There's a lot of different protocol versions. 202 is like the modern one. Um, it, it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Before that gets really gnarly. Um, you do a little bit of math to, which is like weird math, but it's the same everywhere to compute like how far into the, the thing is the, <laughs> all right, more souls leaving bodies, excellent. Um, oh, a little bit more. Yep. <laughs> God, I was down, 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 down they go. So, um, so then you, based off that, you start to understand what you're actually holding. You've confirmed it's a real kernel. You have some idea of what to do with it. You pick a location somewhere in memory. Yep, and you put the kernel payload in there. Um, uh, you pick another location somewhere and you put the command line in um, because the kernel will parse it for you when it comes up. Um, if you're loading an edit RD, which I wasn't, if you are, you put that somewhere in memory too and you remember its location. Um, note that I said copy the header template um, because you copy the header somewhere too and then you start to fill out the header. So you say, what kind of loader am I? In our case, we are undefined because Beehive is not a registered loader type yet. If I ever did know this, I would talk to the necessary Linux person and say, hi, can we have, you know, ID 17 or something, I don't know. Um, you tell it how long the command line is and where it is. You tell it how big the init ID is and where it is. Um, you install the E820 memory map, which is, it's that thing of like, here is the memory and here is the holes in it. The E821 is kind of like a common enough format. I'm glossing over it because honestly, I wrote it last year. I can't remember. Um, and everything is weird, but it's cool. It's fine. So you, Beehive already knew it, so I didn't need to think too much about what it was. I just told it, could you just copy the memory map into that block of memory? Thank you. Um, you set up registers, and this, Linux's own boot documentation, is wrong. And every, there are a number of bootloaders that do for this, and they are all slightly different. So I read five or six different bootloaders. And of course, some of them come up in like, some of them come up in 32-bit mode. And some of them um, do stuff in real mode before they flip in, but then use vestiges of, it's like, it's chaotic. So, but it's fine. But basically, you set up, like, you know, this is like how to set up memory maps, interrupt maps. This tells it where different bits of things are. This, like, this is what you need for it. So you're just pointing different registers to different places to, so that Linux can find stuff. Um, I don't even know why I wrote all this out. Like, it's like, if you know what this is, then you're already wincing because it's kind of, this is a bit iffy, iffy. And if you don't know what it is, it's not helping much. Um, set up page tables. So um, page tables and all this address goes to that address. So an identity mapping is just like, it's just one-to-one -to, -one to start. Um, you turn on various options. So you put it into 64-bit, put the CPU into 64-bit mode. You turn on paging. Um, you disable interrupts. Um, you set your instruction pointer to the start of the kernel stuff, plus, uh, 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 plus 512 by decree. Um, <laughs> it's just a game now. Um, you, yes, why? Because, I mean, which, which underscore start? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's true, but then you've got to start in real mode. And anyway. Yeah, that's okay. Look, it, for the video, it's just like, it's stuff that doesn't matter, but I think we're just having a shared experience, a shared pain experience right now. Um, uh, you set RSI to point to the address of where that, that, that parameter header was. Um, you give it an initial stack. Um, and then you bounce into it. Oh, that's not even bouncing into it. Like, that's what you do. That's all we have to do. That's all we have to do. Um, and then when it starts, it's very nice. Um, the good thing about this loader infrastructure is we can have other kinds of loaders. So I did actually start writing a multi-boot 2 loader. Um, it doesn't work properly, mostly because it's actually really hard to just find a nice multi-boot 2 capable OS blob on the internet somewhere. Um, because I spent an evening looking for one because I didn't want to download a thing and compile a thing. It was my work probably, but like every, everyone making their own operating system is um, building a multi-boot 2 loader. So like if I've got the start of that. So if we had one of those, we could boot all sorts of crazy things um, in exactly the same way. So 
I like this. Um, I am, and I'm hoping to, I would really like to get it polished up and upstreamed for FreeBSD 15. Um, it's not everything I need the quiz. Um, I think as I said, yeah, I'd like to get it at 15. Um, unprivileged Beehive is just the ability to start Beehive without being root, um, which is kind of a nice to have. I don't want to be running as root every time. Um, that I, I'm not committing anyone to anything. I'm just saying that's hoped for 15. I need to be able to do anonymous VMs. At the moment, uh, you can create a VM the first time you use one, but then it hangs around in Beehive's like VM list and you actually have to do like Beehive control, destroy, whatever. I want something where I create anonymously and when, my, when the hypervisor process goes away, um, it disappears too. It's not really hard to do, so it'll probably be me. Like I've, I already know which bit of code it is to go in. I just haven't thought about it much because it's kind of like when I'm testing it, like I just, I just run the program. Um, need nine PFS, hoped for um, fifteen, and um, and ideally overlay FS. Um, but I mean, that's my needs. But I stress this because um, you may have other thing, other things that don't require quite so much. Um, this, that's the last page, so I will reload this with the power of the web. This is a video I took of using a kernel and in an RD lifted from a Debian boot installer just to kind of prove that like this is not a custom kernel needed. Um, that's still not working. Maybe if I reload that one. Maybe if I reload that one. Why are you like this? There we go. No hands. <laughs> this was recorded like six months ago, but it's just a use a good demo. Tell us hmm? Tell us yeah, just there should be a little Yeah, it's just virtual. I'm just uh I'm just uh so yeah, but anyway, so yeah, so like I say, the VM one has an in RDG said, so it it's just it's this is the Debian installer. Um and now it's going, uh, there are no hard drives, what do I do? I say, well, let's go to a shell. Um and then and do some distinctly, uh, so this you would do a sys control for, but like this is Beehive, um, you know, it but with its kernel, and it's cool, it's good. So, um, <laughs> lives for pantomime. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, so like, that's what that is. Um, the other thing that I didn't, Talk to as much was uh, getting QMU running with some people call it Kimu and QMU anyway um, with Beehive acceleration because like QMU has acceleration backends and if you you know if you run on Linux it uses KVM if you run on Windows it uses Windows thing if you run on macOS it uses macOS thing it's like I thought why doesn't it use Beehive thing how hard can that be to do they probably have a shared like like they probably have a common pattern for that I didn't know you had any pain left in you man. <laughs> Um, yeah, it, VMMKO, which is the kernel component of Beehive, is kind of fundamentally incompatible with the way that QME wants to operate. Um, I'm just gonna, I'm actually gonna read my slides this time, wow. Um, QME wants to build, wants to like allocate memory, map devices in that city, and then hand the thing to the kernel and say, here is your machine, like give me a CPU, let's go. Um, Beehive, instead says to the kernel, could you give me um, two gig of memory to use as system memory? Could you give me a chunk to use as a boot ROM? And you know, can you give me a chunk to use at, for device pass through? Um, which means you can only, like you can only have like three regions or something, and you, they can only be the ones that like Beehive kind of knows about. Um, so, what we need to do is flip that on its head. We need to have the same model as everyone else. Um, but I'm not sure exactly how to approach that. We could remake VMMKO the right way. I'm reliably informed by um, uh, the fellow who wrote it. It was kind enough to write me a private email saying that's probably a fool's errand. And I'm like, okay, I should maybe I should listen to that. Maybe he's wrong. Um, I was thinking about porting NVMM from NetBSD be, just because the API is really nice 
like it doesn't have any fuss it just says map a host region unmap a host region map a guest region unmap a guest region it's like that's it um you know or we could just go all in and just say well screw it we're just going to implement every damn thing in beehive so we don't even need qmu that's probably less likely but you you know you always need like the high price point so that you come back to the middle price point uh, but yeah um that's wow I did talk fast. That's actually all I have. Um, the point mostly, apart from showing some weird stuff, is kernels are just programs. Like, don't imagine that a kernel is some kind of weird thing. Like, it's just code. Just like find a way to run it, find a way to twist it to get what you need out of it. Um, you know, VMs and things like that make it so, so easy to get into this stuff now. Like write some cool tools and just do stuff. So there, yeah, be inspired. No, seriously, it's pretty cool. Um, that's all I got. I'm happy to, it's super early. I would happy, I mean, it's last last session, but I'm happy to answer questions or show other things. Um, I thought I would run way over time, but anyway, yeah. Would uh, so you do, you do a tiny bit of kernel care, that's pretty good to you. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I could do it that way. Um, sure, we'll go. <laughs> I mean, like, like it's, it's one of those things like that is not, like that feels like not the way I'd want to do it, but if that, but if that existed, like that would be great. And, you know, and all of these things, I think, you know, just like that kind of environmental control, being able to just, you know, move things around, especially like, Oh, great. Well, yeah. Um, 100% All right. Yeah, I'm going to have to get an arm machine, aren't I? <laughs> All right, I'll have a look. I'll have a look. Thank you. Because, um, yeah, I would like to look at that. I didn't, I need to repeat for the, the camera. It was just um, uh, 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 about KXX support um, in the FreeBSD kernel. So you could start your Linux kernel and then have it do an exec, replace itself with a FreeBSD kernel and go from that. And uh, uh, when I was just saying that uh, coming soon. So that might be fun. Yeah, Mark. Good. I, I sort of thought about it last night, but I realized I didn't. I'm like, hang on, that could be the same thing, but I'm not sure. But it kind of has to be, doesn't it? Because otherwise you're just going to have this weird vestige left that a user made, but who, what? Yeah. 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 <laughs> anyway, sorry again for the camera. Sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll get the question in a sec. But yeah, for the camera, it was just uh, Mark was saying the unprivileged beehive usage, the uh, uh, anonymous VM you know, cleanup once it's done will kind of fall out of that um, because otherwise it's like who owns the remaining piece left and it's sort of it's part of that so uh, so that's one thing I don't have to do so thank you <laughs> yeah yeah which, which is how I was thinking to do it so I'm glad Yeah. Um, no, no, I do know that I, I do know this. Um, I will tell you, I will tell you what I know and then you can tell me whether it's right or not. Um, so the question, the question was beehive load exists and beehive load, um, kind of it, it, it it sets it sets up in memory and calls into the FreeBSD loader to you know set up for that set the registers and whatever and then hands that off to a VM. So kind of so the question was basically could have re, could I have reused that 
uh, because it already does the register setup and um, that sort of stuff. And so the the easy answer is like very early I asked someone, um, someone at Clara, I forget who it was, I don't, I don't know, I said, like, how wedded are FreeBSD people to Beehive load? Should I, like, try and... Because I, I didn't really understand the model, the Beehive load model, the Beehive model. It's not the way... It's not kind of the QMU linux -y kind of thing. So, I'm like, is this model interesting or important? Are people going to be upset if if I changed it or, or did something? Or is that the way to do it and I need to learn more about it? And a couple of people went, yeah, it's kind of a vestigial thing. Just do your thing. So, I just did my thing. Um, pardon? Um, originally, the I did not have a group on at all. Mm. And the basic idea was he did something to initialize memory and set threat. And then when the I started, it started running the GPU and the GPU runner and the device model. And that's how Matt first did it. Right. Um, so it was actually another one. It was, of course, for us. So it worked the same way. Everything was the same thing. But you could have a very small program that is just, you know, shove bits of memory, then run behind it, just like run the GPU. Yeah. Um, so it's really just can you put those things in two places, or do you have them as part of one process? Yeah. So one advantage of this one process is it makes the anonymous thing easier. Yeah. Um, if it weren't for that, it would seem simpler to just have another one of the sub Google or program that you run that is initialize my memory and my register set, and then behind the search that just thing runs the show. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, that, 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 but that's the thing. That's how it evolved. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. We needed the bootloader because we have our own special magic. So, but I think so. If it weren't for kind of the anonymous thing, it would be it would have been maybe quicker to write a little program that is just enough to be on and mm. crap it around. Um, but the eventual goal of having it self contained, I do think you kind of want to set the list. And you can, and the, eventually, another model would be even better. We have both be something that he has itself kind of works with. Yeah. Um, so, do it so it's contained in a single process, or at least so that it owns it. A lot of Related question is Beehive does have a thing called storing the power. So if your guest actually is kind of nice, you know, they uh and I think DPI has mm -hmm. shut down because it gets dumped in the so Yes. Um yeah. You don't have a DPI and your guests are kind of panicked with a simple uh, yeah, and like I, I could make it do that, but also I still want to be able to like just control C the whole damn thing. Um because I want it to still feel like a real Thing. But I mean, that's that's just me. If everyone turned up and went like, "That's kind of a sketchy thing to want," I'm like, "Fine, I'll get QMU working then, and we'll be fine." Um, but, um, if it does a clean shutdown, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I could like, yeah, I, like I, I'm not particularly wedded to the way that I did it. Like, it's very sort of. Um, yeah. <laughs> we could, we could, but you could wire could wire Yeah, you, you could. Totally could. Totally could. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I, I don't know. There, yeah, there are there are multiple ways you could do it. One of the things I at least would like to do is, um, general. So there is, reg like there is register setup code for FreeBSD, um, in. Like, like in well, it's in, it's in the it's in the kernel module and it's in libvmm. There's two copies of it, which that's four. There's two copies of it. Um, I forget where, but it's there. And also, it wasn't quite the same as what Linux wanted to do, obviously. Um, so I feel like, and then I feel like if you're going to add other loaders, like multiboot two does a different thing again. It would at least be good to generalize that. Like it is a lot of work. I mean, maybe I went about it the wrong way, but it is a lot of work to actually like do the register setup where you've got to, particularly for like the um, the segment registers, because you've got to kind of set you know, set the segment register and the shadow register at the same time. And at the time, I knew nothing about these concepts. Like, like I had the Intel manual out, and I'm trying. So, um, so I still don't really know if what I've done is right. But 
uh, maybe that's why I can't get multi-boot 2 to work. Um, but uh, but yeah, like I, I'm not particularly whether I would genuinely like to have someone who knows the architecture, like knows the plans bigger to say, this, this is the box where this stuff should go. And I'll be like, great, I'll do it. Effectively, if you look at the two scrubs that you have, you have loaded around, that's the ultimate loader, and the implementation of Beehive is that once it's trained at the end, you go and force it out and then run it, and then allow that to run, and then what Beehive waits until that's done before it decides to. Like, yeah. that's the implementation of the loader. So it's yeah. not pretty good for it to expect. Right. You look at it, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, well, so the other way you can have different loaders, right? You can have a loader. I'm just I'm going to be a moderator for a sec because I just don't know the videos on. We've just had a whole conversation about whether this uh, whether this load of stuff should live in Beehive or in Beehive load and how they should sort of talk to each other and that we keep having that conversation. But we just want to make sure that um, uh, anyone else who had a question um, uh, get gets to ask it before um, we pack up and head out. Fair not? Okay. <laughs> Oh, you can still go, Mark. The video is still on. Thank you so much, really. Yeah. Uh, I think I think we're done, so we can turn the video off. Uh, thank you. Thanks, video.